Gentlemen, thank you. I thought we would start out by talking about collusion and obstruction. Yeah, right. <laughs> by which I mean the appointment of the Senate budget conferees. <laughs> Wait, I have to go get a call from Sherry Sylvester. Hold on. Um, what? Your, what mother, your mother would not be proud. <laughs> no, my, my mother is cheering me on right now. Are you kidding me? What the hell happened with the budget conferee? So yesterday we had conferees appointed by Lieutenant Governor Patrick to go to conference on the budget with the House. Five Republicans, no Democrats. We looked it up and could not find a, a situation since Republicans took control of the Senate in which a Democrat had not been appointed as a budget conferee, Eva DeLuna Castro of the Center for Public Policy Priorities went back further and found that the last time the budget conferees were all of one party was 1987, when Bill Hobby appointed all Democrats. Senator Seliger, is this a good thing or a bad thing for the Senate and for Texas? Um, let's see how things transpire. In and of itself, it's neither good or bad. They're, they're all capable members. They were all, I, I think, on the finance committee. It's too early to say. The optics, maybe, are not as, as bipartisan as they could be, but it's neither good nor bad on the surface of it. You, so you're not prepared to say that there's a message being sent by the lieutenant governor or an intended outcome that the lieutenant governor is trying to reverse engineer by the appointment of these conferees? Uh, that's a little obscure to me. It may be, but I don't think it's obvious. These, it's people, a number of whom have been on conference before. Yeah. At least in the case of, of Senators Nelson and Huffman and Colcourst. Uh, is there a, a message, however subliminal, that, the, that this is going to be a tougher committee or something like that? I don't see it just at this point. Senator Watson, you've served under the, the lieutenant governor since he was inaugurated uh, into that office in 2015. What you know about him, I suspect, is what I know about him. He is the most transparent guy in the world. When he tells you who you, he is, believe him, right? Right. Um, he, he telegraphs everything he does. There's never not a message. There's never well, not a plan. I, I um, yeah, and I came in the Senate. He and I uh, started the same time. We, right. we, we came in the Senate at the same time in January of 07. Um, I agree, and, and uh, look, all of the members of the conference committee are very good members, and I could argue. It's not about them. For, yeah, right. I could argue for every one of them being on the conference committee. And you only so so the, if you, those that don't know, the way the conference committee is set up is you have five members, and that's all you're going to have is you're going to have five members. Um, but the fact that there is, there was not a Democrat put on there, I, I do think is 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 a, a sign. Um, if you also look at the, the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, it's been eroded in terms of its bipartisanship as well. The Senate Finance Committee has 15 members on it, so it's almost half of the Senate. And for years, uh, it had at least five Democrats on it. Now, significant minority, right, uh, out of 15. Uh, I see some of you that I know can do math and, and realize that. But uh, and, and to be on the Finance Committee, I was able to do that math. Um, right. But But... And in fairness, Democrats have had about one third lately of the membership, right? And so sure. So rough, I, I'm not. not I'm, I'm not. not one, but but it was it was at five. But it's a, right. that's a small number. And then what happened was uh, when Senator Uresti uh, ran into trouble and was taken off, that position was filled with another Republican. And then there was some thought that okay, well that will just be until we get to the next session, and there will be a change, and there was a change in the membership of the Senate where that fifth position could have been filled, but it wasn't filled with a Democrat. So there's been even a slow erosion there. Right. Um, I'm proud to be on there, and probably the answer I'm giving right now means I won't be in the future. But, um, <laughs> but um, I intend to get you into a lot more trouble yeah, between now uh, and 9 o'clock, yeah, um, believe me. But the truth yeah. of the matter is I, I do... It, it's regrettable, particularly when... The lieutenant governor does like to talk about how we're bipartisan. Well, I want to ask you about that. Well, so, can I yeah, add please, a couple yes, of things yes. here? Sure, sure, sure. One, in the most recent past, uh, Senator Juan Hinojosa from Corpus Christi, I think was on the last conference committee. Well, I think he's been on the last several conference yeah, committees. Yeah, and did a great yeah. job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is, I don't care who is on the conference committee. Well. That at the end of the day, everything is going to be approved by the lieutenant governor anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, so that's a great point, and that's a great question. What, is the, what does this tell us, or stepping back from this specifically, what does what we've seen for these months tell us about the lieutenant governor's grip on the Senate? 
his approach to leadership. Does he strike you at this moment, Senator Seliger, as somebody confident in his grip on the Senate, or is he somebody who feels like maybe the ground is shifting under his feet, and so this appointment of budget conferees is an indication that he feels he needs to assert himself in a way, because somebody confident in his leadership, somebody confident in the membership of the Senate following behind him might not feel he needed to do something that is, if not unprecedented, at least is aberrational in recent memory. He doesn't need to do anything assertive right now because he asserts himself frequently and, and, and effectively, I would say. And so is... Exhibit A. Is... You talking about him? No, no. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, there's, there's, there's let's let's address that very briefly. I Wait, mean, you, let's answer. Let's do this okay, question okay, first. Okay, and then we're, <laughs> we're going to do the you do you, and then I'll do me. Okay, ahead, yeah. well, let me give as long an answer as I possibly can <laughs> okay, here. Good, yeah. <laughs> you held the door open. I just walked through it. Yeah, I wish I hadn't yeah. done that. Yeah. Um, and, and that is, I think that that his grip, if you choose to call it that, I think is fairly firm, and he knows it, and the members know it. And the need to assert it yesterday, I, I don't see the need. S Senator Watson, the fact is that in this House, the current speaker and the last speaker at least, maybe not so much Speaker Craddock, talked about leading the body by the will of the members. That's one philosophy of leadership. The other philosophy of leadership is that you are the chair of every single committee in the body that you lead. Is, is, is Lieutenant Governor Patrick not effectively the chair of every committee of the Senate? Well, he, by virtue of being the presiding officer, and the way he uh, uses that gavel and that position, uh, he plays a, a, a big role, if not an oversized role, in what happens in, in, in the various committees. Yeah. It, it, and, and, of course, we know that the lieutenant governor, the position of lieutenant governor is said always to be the most powerful position in Texas, more so than even the office of governor. This is a particularly powerful lieutenant governor, even in the recent history of lieutenant governors, right? If you're asking me, yeah, sure. And, and, and part of that is, in my view, that the Senate, as a Senate, uh, goes along with that more than maybe it should. Let, let me ask about the, the byproducts of the election, Senator Seliger, because as I mentioned in my introduction to the two of you, you were kind enough to come out in November and be part of a legislative preview. Ross sat down with you at the Alumni Center in November to preview what was going to happen this session. We know what the election was, and we know that there was, in theory, a message delivered by the voters about how they wanted the legislature, both chambers, individual members, to behave. This is what you said in November. I went back and watched that video. You, you were talking about what this kind of... I watch it of, all the time. What this, kind of, <laughs> ...what this kind of session was going to be, or how this session would be. You said, Senator Seliger, maybe, just maybe, there'll be an added emphasis on bipartisanship on cooperation, realizing we've got to get to May together with some real challenges that don't really look like Republican challenges or Democratic challenges. This was going to be an all business, no bullshit, no sharp objects on the table. Just don't nope. say anything about Pollyanna, will you? <laughs> well, no, I'm not suggesting you're a Pollyanna, but I am suggesting that you thought coming out of the election, and you no. were not alone, Senator Watson, yeah. thought that this would be a session that would look like a different session. Has it? Let me ask the Passover question. Why is this session different from every other session? <laughs> I, I don't know that it is. Yeah. I mean, what observation do you have that says it's, it's much different than others? But you thought it would be. You thought it might be. I thought it would because I thought that, that um, what the voters were telling us, that there, the voter attraction was going to be more toward the middle. Um, as, as John Cornyn said back in the fall, that urban Texas is blue and suburban Texas is purple, and the only part that's really red is rural Texas. So how do we, how do we move over into the suburban areas? How do we cross party lines and things with some sort of, of message and procedure? And yeah, that's, that's the way I thought it would, would work. Didn't actually happen that way. Not exactly. The, we've been wrong before. I mean, I, I have. in fact, we agreed to do this today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's bipartisan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. S Senator Watson, you yourself said at the ledge preview the election itself and the message of the election was in theory going to produce, you hoped, a legislature that while still uh, majority Republican, right. led by Republicans, even majority conservative, would at least acknowledge we're going to do the business of the state, we're going to stick to a couple yards on either side of midfield and then get the hell out. Right? 
work. I, and I, I hope that would be the case. Yeah. That, in, in my view, has not been, um, that has not been the case. Yeah. So the theory of the case Senator Seliger coming out of the election was when the Democrats beat Senator Huffines mm -hmm. and Senator Burton, and the number went down to 1912, I said many times and believed Senator Seliger is the most powerful man in Texas. You need 19 votes to bring up a bill on the floor. If Senator Seliger chooses to, he can bring the business of the Senate to a halt. I and everybody else were living in the realm of fan fiction. <laughs> were we not? You were never going to not be a Republican. You were never not going to vote with the party the majority of the time. I mean, you and the lieutenant governor bickered like an old married couple, but like most old married couples, you didn't get divorced, right? You're, you're not, you're not, <laughs> right? I mean, the fact is, there may have been some, there may have been some drama at the beginning, but anybody who was looking for you to become Senator Kel Seliger, Democrat of Amarillo, was smoking something. I will, I will defer to my attorney friend to, to say the difference between that and estrangement is very small. Right, but even in an estranged thing, you all are still on the same page on 95% of stuff, don't you think? Sure. Sub substantively, you're still voting. I mean, the t property tax bill notwithstanding, I mean, hell, you voted for David Whitley in the nominations committee. You voted on almost every issue on mm -hmm. which there was a thought that you might break with the party either to, to, uh, to as assert your independence or not. I'm you very, really haven't broken with the party. No, I'm very secure in my, in my, my philosophy and membership as, as a Republican. I cannot be a, a cipher or some sort of doctrinaire conservative, and that's just not... But just can, you, can you give me an example on the, other than the property tax issue just to this point in the session where somebody who heard you say that would see evidence on the page? No. Well, sure, the evidence is, is there. Like you said, I vote the way the majority of Republicans do 95, 98% of the time. Personal issues notwithstanding, you're still representing your district. Your district is conservative, peace and blessings, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, where we, where we diverge there is we are very often given polling that says that this measure polls this in your district, so you need to vote for it. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, with the good polls, but it depends upon how the question is asked, one. And two, as I've pointed out, I don't do a lot of polling. I live there. Right. And those are the people. You, you're your own poll. Those are the people yeah. I live with. I've made it a point in a huge area that's just slightly larger than the state of Indiana to do a town hall meeting in every county every year. There's been right. 440 of them. And talk to people in, in, in available. And uh, I think I know what the sense of my, of my district is. And every four years, they've gotten a chance to affirm that. Right, and so there was n really never a chance that as a consequence of whatever happened at the beginning of the session with you, the lieutenant governor, that that was going to manifest itself in you voting with the other party, except in those cases where you felt like the best way to represent your district was to not go along with, with the majority. Right, and, but nobody ever talks about the possibility that the Democrats are simply voting with me. <laughs> Isn't that the nature of leadership? <laughs> I think you just gave Victor well Leal a yeah. campaign ad Thank for the you. next time, yeah. actually, <laughs> candidly. Um, Senator Watson, let me flip around the theory of the case coming out of the election before we get into the substance of this. The theory of the case was that the Democrats would matter this time in the Senate in a way that they maybe did not matter the last time in the Senate because you beat Don Huffines and Connie Burton. But really, what has been different? You know, 1813 is a hell of a lot more different than 1912 than 1912 is different from 2010 or 2110. It turns out the most important and powerful man in Texas is Pete Flores. You guys couldn't hold the arrestee seat, and therefore the Democrats don't matter nearly as much as you would have had it been 1813. Well, um, there's... I wish I could diagram whatever that sentence was. Um, <laughs> get, get, just give up. There's because, no way. Because, yeah. because I, it could take us all day to go into different yeah. aspects of that and how I might yeah. disagree, but I, I'll just go with the flow of the sentence yeah. um, and, and, and say that um, there is little question that in the, under the current circumstances, just picking up two seats has not changed the dynamic of the Senate. Democrats don't have any more influence on the outcome of something in the positive or the negative in this session, really, with those numbers 
as they are different from less of. That's, I think that's You're an agree. accurate state statement. So back to this and question. And that one yeah. I understood. Yeah, that one you got. Good. All right. Yeah. Back, back to this question, Senator Seliger, of where you feel you may need to break with the party. In fewer than 11 minutes, tell me, which was the length of your remarks on right. SB2 uh, and on the blocker, <laughs> on the blocker bill, uh, the only person who gets to speak for 11 minutes is me. Um, why, did you, why did you relent? Why did you make the decision as you did to, uh, to, to vote to bring the bill to the floor? Because the die was cast and the bill was going to pass anyway. What was the point? The point was... No, that was your, your saying, but yeah. what's, 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 what's the point of forcing the lieutenant governor's hand on this to, to, to pass the blocker bill? It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass. If we had taken the nuclear option, yeah. that, that really is a lot of value. It's a lot of value symbolically as well as, as practically because it makes things look collegial and stuff, and it very often is that way. And we were all going to get painted with the same brush, in, including me, and I didn't, my vote wasn't for that measure, which I voted against. My vote was for the Senate itself, for its tradition and the image it ought to have as a deliberative body. Right, but we just spent a couple of minutes ago talking about the fact that the tradition of the Senate, at least for the last 32 years, has been to appoint members of the other party to the budget. There's going to be another conference. 32. Say again? There's going to be another 32. How's that? Well, the Senate will go on. Right. The state will go on. Right. Different people will be there. And taking be, action. Be best, ultimately, right? Be, be your best self. Yeah, that, that, and I think that's the way I read what the senator did and... and um, appreciated about what he did is that you would have done the same thing. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, but but I was. Not, I think he was in a very 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 unique position um, that nobody else in the Senate is in. And <laughs> and because of that, I think he was in, in a position to do something that hopefully speaks to the future of the Senate and not necessarily to the moment. And we all tend to focus on the moment and say, oh my goodness, did it really make a difference? Well, it may have made a difference in how things operate down the road. And too little time in my view right now in the Texas Senate is spent thinking about what are we doing about the future and right. how are we winning a specific political fight right Senate. now. But one of these days, yeah. when, you, when you ask Kirk, would you have done the same thing in that situation? And his answer is fine, but one of these days he is going to be in that situation. Or another Democrat sitting in that seat is going to the situation, be in that situation because they are going to be in the majority. What is he going to do then? Right, so you think that the long-term play here is, is put the good of the Senate and mm -hmm. the good of Texas ahead of any political fights that you may have. The long-term right play now. is the long-term. Is the flip side of that, Senator, that... What is to stop the lieutenant governor from doing this every time he doesn't get his sure. way? I mean, in, in some ways, haven't you now given license, not you, let's just make it the royal you, let's not put this all on you personally, okay. but haven't, hasn't the royal you now given the lieutenant governor license to, to trot out the blocker bill card every time there's an issue on which people disagree? Hasn't this behavior been enabled going forward? Absolutely. Yeah, but maybe just maybe next time that the, the, if I accomplish nothing else, some other members will say we, we, we got brought back from the brink once. Let's don't go back to the brink. There, it's, a, it's a zero sum game. And make no mistake, if a bunch of Republicans had said, no, nah, we don't want to go there. We'd be on a different path now with with no retribution or something like that because it just it, retribution doesn't work on a large group like right. that. You you go and and take it out on too many Republicans, you'd have to appoint a bunch of Democrats <laughs> chairman, and I think the lieutenant governor would be loath to do that. L L has shown himself here. Yeah, so it would be all that's left. Yeah, the uh, uh, you both voted against SB two on the floor. The threshold was raised from 2.5 to 3.5 for cities and counties. It, was rem it remained at 2.5 for schools, uh, school districts, school taxes. Uh, it did not include some of the carve-outs that had been discussed, community colleges. I mean, there were a bunch of things that were on the table, but it ultimately did not get there. Uh, S Senator Watson, what, what about this bill could have gotten you there? Was there anything that you would have been... I mean, you tried to get the school districts exempted from it. That was your amendment. It didn't succeed. What could have gotten you there? Would that have been enough? 
What could have gotten me there was real discussion and real debate and real work to try to figure out what we need to do. There's not a single member of the Texas Senate, Democrat or Republican, that doesn't want there to be property tax relief. We all want property tax relief. We all recognize the burden that it's putting on our constituents. But we start with the proposition that the biggest culprit in your property tax problem is the legislature. For a decade, we've had the legislature relying upon the growth of property values to fund the state legislature's constitutional obligation for public schools to the point that what happened during that period of time, uh, there was you know, about $10 billion worth of growth in property values that if the priority had really been reducing property taxes, instead of relying upon that growth and using the way the, the, the formula works is that when property values go up and local property taxes go up, the state's share of the school funding goes down. Instead of using that additional revenue for other purposes, the, the, those in control of the capital could have used it for property tax relief or could have not been uh, reducing the, the franchise tax or the margins tax, which was created in large part in 2006 or reformed or changed, whatever is the politically correct term, in 2006 to provide property tax relief. That could have been done. Now what happens is because the public is recognizing that, there's a need to play the blame game. Who do we blame for this property tax problem or crisis? And what's happened is it's been the cities and counties that get pointed to. Right. Then what occurred is basically we were told, here is the box. Go ahead and you can move pieces in the box if you want. You can go 3.5% and 25% exemption for police, or you can do this and that. But you can never get out of the box. There was no negotiation. What, what there is was the, no what, discussion. Senator, what is, the, what is the box? What would have been... I mean, again, it's, it's taking you at your word, everybody wants to see this number go down. And the fact is that the 8% threshold dates to a time when we had double-digit inflation. Sure. The 8% threshold was because at the time we had double-digit inflation. The inflation rate went down, but the threshold never went down. Sure. Right? You, so very, you, assume you, that you, you, you read the talking points of the Republican Party. Well, but, well, but are those facts or are they not facts? I'm not well, reading they're, they're, the talking points. They're facts, points. but the, the, question, the question is... Tell me why, I mean, I almost start with the proposition yeah. that tell me what is broken about our system of government that we all get to vote for mayors and city councils, we all get to vote for county judges and county commissioners, and we say to them, we want you to deal with our local taxation and the services that we demand and need for quality of life. We want you to take care of that. I shouldn't be making decisions in Austin, Texas about what the Amarillo mayor is doing. Similarly, the Amarillo senator shouldn't ma be making decisions about the people that are elected in Austin and what they ought to be doing. So, we, we, uh, so let us start with the proposition, and I'm pretty firm on this proposition, that I actually do believe yeah. that these local elections matter as much as my election to the, to the Senate. Yeah. Now, having said that, there might be things that could be done, but, but Evan, we've never had that discussion. We were given a proposal, and then we held hostage, not we, it was the HB3, which will get us potentially to our real property tax relief, was held hostage, and we were told we were not going to be able to see it. In fact, it was set for a hearing in the, in the Senate Education Committee and taken off the agenda because of what was going to happen on SB2. Now, sometime next week, we're going to get to see it. People will say, well, we weren't really ready, which is a, a shocking uh, statement when we're this close to the end of the session and we're now going to finally see... You think there are procedural games going on here? Sure. Yeah, so you, so it's, I use the word hostage. So, so let me ask you... So, well, but hold on. So hold on. So, so, but, but I want to understand. So what you're saying, as you challenge the premise that I laid out, that... You know, I think maybe talking points, but also are facts. Those things are not mutually exclusive. You would have kept it at 8% if you had your druthers? There might be a number that I would go to with certain exemptions built into it. Right. But I don't, right now, even though we need to have property tax relief, I still trust the voters that if they want to hear that statement that you just made, that, well, 
the, the cap is, is too big. And if you look at what's happening in a lot of cities, they're not going to 8%. Otherwise, right. you would be having rollback elections. So look at the facts of that as well. The point being, the voters could say to them, I don't want you spending those tax dollars on police. I'm mad that you're spending it on parks and playgrounds and libraries and fire stations and EMS. So I'm going to vote against you doing that. Right. And that's not happening. Right. S uh, Senator. First of all, every local election, every election is a tax election. That's right. And it's a rollback election and it's a recall election. If you don't go vote, that's a vote too. It's a vote for the status quo. I introduced a couple of measures, and it was interesting. Public Policy Foundation said, Kel Seliger is against uh, property tax reform. Absolute, total, and complete lie because I introduced bills. One yeah. that said appraisals, a right. hard cap at 5%. You came in it through that door, right? Yeah, he yeah. Did. He sure did. which is what people complain about most in all these town hall meetings is the appraisal. Right. And two, sets an automatic election for rollback rate to be determined anywhere from the current down. The problem was... We started at 2.5% instead of the 8% where we are now to ratchet down. You shouldn't negotiate it down as opposed to negotiate it up. I think so because what we ended up doing for the last week is negotiating against ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Instead of talking to local officials, and I represent 37 counties and I don't know, a couple hundred cities, and say, if this is going to happen anyway, what can you live with? They're happy to take something less than 8%. And the discussion yeah. was about 5 to to 6, where we may very well end up. But um, they just... Does no having been a former mayor, Senator Seligor or Senator Watson, that gives you a perspective different from just the average person who ends up in the Senate? Sure it does. Because you've been a local official, you've been on the receiving end of it. Yeah, I got So why you. isn't Senator Nichols with you? Ask him to come to one of these. I, I have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to speak for another senator on this, but but I will say certainly from my perspective, having been a, a, a mayor yep. um, and recognizing the level of effort and time and thought that goes into putting in budgets and the listening to the citizens about what it is they want and frankly could have thrown me out if they disagreed with what I was doing. Right. Um, that Yeah, sure. I don't, I truly don't believe that the last smart thing my constituents did was sending me to the Senate. Let me, uh, since I'm reading from the talking points, let me listen to my earpiece. It's like Cyrano de Betancourt here, right? <laughs> let, me actually, let me actually say the other half of this, which is, why do you hate democracy? If, if, the, if you can make as compelling a case about the need for that additional revenue to me, you can make it to the voters. All they're saying is, Go to the voters if it goes above 2.5%. Why not go to the voters? Don't you trust your voters? They, well, I'm, go ahead. Well, go ahead, sure. Yeah, both of us in the last jump couple on that of, In the last couple of years, if you look around the state of Texas, how many incumbent city officials lost? The vast majority of them won re-election, and nobody that I heard of ran on a platform of cutting property taxes in half. Why is that? What a great campaign approach that is in, in, in a sure winner. And it's because, rightly or wrongly, people trust those locally elected officials. Yeah. Because one, they elected them, and two, they're always there and they're always accessible. And, and if uh, they're mad at you, they come to your house. That's right. Right? That's, that, oh, no, that's, that's literally true. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, the, you, well, you and, think and, the real accountability is the regular elections? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, would, I would flip that question. Yeah. Why do you not love democracy? The elections that put these people in the positions to make those decisions is democracy. And it's, it's, a, it, it's as important an election as the election that, that puts us in the legislature. And, and, and the important point about that is, you don't get to define what is the love of democracy. Let that election matter. And, and they actually represent the people that are making those decisions. So, um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm for those elections. Those elections do matter, um, and, and they, they make a difference, and people can be thrown out of right. office. Let me, let me say one other yeah, thing. Sure. Um, I don't think that anything should be lost on anybody. I voted against two different numbers last session that were higher than three and a half. Um, 
so you were not for the four. I was not for the four, and, and I wasn't for the six. So, so the, the bottom line to it is, is I don't think anybody ought to be surprised by my vote. You, you've been consistent. I so, voted against the state control of private possession of chickens. <laughs> no, you, it, 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 it links. But the, <laughs> not really. Yeah. The same people who vote for us are the people who vote for the mayor and the county commissioner. I, I would be afraid we create the, the impression that they are so visionary and perspicacious that they vote for us, but when it comes to local elections, they're, they're not smart enough. They're, they're not they're, smart enough. Yeah, they have no right. conviction. And, and I'll say one last right. thing. I want to get the sales tax. Well, well yeah. I want to say one last yeah. thing about what you, you, you said about the, the democracy of it. You know, I may be the only fellow that actually went to the voters in advance of a tax increase and sold a property tax increase to the voters. Yeah. So I truly believe you in, know what in that process. Like. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, it, for those that don't know, um, I was the leader on an effort to get a property tax increase uh, for Central Health, our, our, our Travis County Healthcare District, for that money to be used for a variety of different things, including support of a medical, medical school, school at the University right. of Texas at Austin. Right. And, and, and I went to the voters on that. So there are ways to do that in addition, right. but this bill, this bill didn't even really allow that. It allowed for a one year. You know, if you've ever done any local government, you know you can't do any sort of planning under those circumstances. Right. So let me ask you about this, the part B of this, which is the discussion of, of sales tax, of an increase by 1% in the sales tax that has now been proposed and backed by the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker. As I understand this plan, it would buy down property tax rates uh, by 20 cents per every $100 of valuation. Is that right? Um, Senator Watson, when was the last time you agreed with Grover Norquist and Michael Quinn Sullivan on something? I want to hear this. <laughs> well, I have not done that study. Right. Uh, I don't know. So you, you uh, are opposed, Senator Watson, to this plan? I am. Yeah, and, and the conservatives are opposed to it simply because it raises taxes. This, leaving well, aside the question of where that money goes, it is a tax increase. Conservatives have said, when do we become the party of tax increases? Your concern with the bill, Senator Watson, is what? I have a, a multiple concerns, but but fundamentally, um, my my concern is that this would uh, have an, an undue impact on. There, there'd be a lot of folks in my district, and frankly, a lot of folks in the state of Texas that would not see any sort of tax break. Um, that it would fall for, you know, for people that are renters. Uh, they would not be getting any of the, the, the buy-down, if you will, on property taxes. Yep. Uh, we would have to put ourselves in the hands of the, the owners of those rental units that they, oh, I got a, a property tax break, so now I'm going to reduce, pass it along I'm going to pass all that, that yep. along to everybody, and I, I don't believe that would really happen. And I think that the regressive nature of it is, yeah. is such that, that I, I'm opposed to that. I, and you're assuming that it goes all to property tax relief because there's a, a fight within the fight, and that is whether the, ex, uh, if you raise the percent, whether it's all going to go to property tax or whether someone goes to education. A absolutely. And here's the other thing. You, you would have to do it, you'd have to do it constitutionally or there, because there's no reason to trust that it will be continued to be placed on property tax relief. Uh, there's, you know, all you have to do is go back to 2006 and the special session where we created a taxing mechanism, a revenue source called the margins tax that was created to provide property tax relief. There may have been some other reason for it, but the primary reason was to provide property tax relief. And what has happened is we have degraded that over time. There's even legislation filed this time to take it down even more. So to tell me that what we're going to do is we're going to become, uh, we're going to have the highest sale, we're going to tie with California for the highest sales tax in the country in some effort to give other tax relief, I don't trust it. So you're opposed. Are you for or against? I'm, at this point, I'm neutral because and my concerns are mostly empirical. And that is the, that I want to see mathematically what it does. Because let's say you go to a place like Seagraves and you compress that property tax, but a good deal of, of the disposable income in that city goes to Lubbock. And so what happens if in sales with the increased sales tax, you don't get the benefit 
then you don't compensate C, for the compression in, in of the C tax rate. You don't get the benefit in Seagraves, but you get but, but, but Seagraves property taxes go down, but the money goes somewhere else that you would be using to replace it. Well, yeah, that's true with a lot of cities in the panhandle where, where folks come to Amarillo. They come to the it's big city. It's kind of a hub. Yeah, it works right. for Lubbock. It works right. for Austin and neighboring communities. I want to see what the net fiscal impact is all over the state. So, so if you were for it, so you're neutral, it, if, if you got to yes, would it require that all the revenue generated through the increase in sales tax go 100% of it go to property taxes? I think at this point, yeah, I think that would be my preference. So, you're, so you're, that would be your preference over a split of some kind. Huberty's talking about 80-20 on the House side. On but yeah, here's sort of the existential question yeah. that I have with Republicans in power. We, we have a budget that all the Democrats could vote for. Yeah, it was unanimous, right? And you all yeah. passed the budget, right? And yeah. now we're talking about a, a tax increase. How conservative are we? So you're also with Grover Norquist <laughs> in asking that question. I would have to say no just on the surface of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just say fact check. I'm, just, right. I'm <laughs> just going to say my you, motivation you, you, you must to, be different. So you need... so. To, to Senator Watson's point, this is going to need to be a constitutional amendment. You're going to need two-thirds of the House and the Senate. You're going to need Democrats to support this, Senator Watson, for this to get to two-thirds. Are there Democrats who are going to support this? I don't. Right now, if the vote were held today, I would be shocked if um, you had two-thirds. Is every Republican... I mean, Betancourt, actually, for about five minutes last week, seemed to say that he was not into this and then slightly walked that back, if I understand from our reporting at the Tribune. And he said, well, I didn't actually mean to say I was opposed. I'm actually kind of waiting to see. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I, I just, what I read yesterday, and it might have been the Tribune, that there are purportedly three, four, five Republicans right. who are somewhere between noncommittal and, 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 and not persuaded, yeah. but nobody will identify. Of course, them. we heard that also, that there were more than just you between noncommittal and not persuaded on SB2, mm -hmm. and then magically on the day of the vote, everybody went to yes, so. Such is the nature of magic. Such is the nature, indeed. <laughs> Senator Watson, you talked about the education legislation, that there was kind of a, you said eight, you, so HB3 was on the agenda, that it wasn't on the agenda. Wh where are we on this? The Senate seems to be lagging. It's atypical. The Senate is typically the one that slams doors open in terms of passing legislation, right? They're always the first ones in. This time, you guys are hanging back a little bit. The House has taken the lead on that. What's going to happen here? Well, I don't know is the answer, and that's, and that's a troubling answer. Yeah. Um, I look at the calendar, and we're, we're, we're getting late. I was very surprised when um, the, the filing deadline, the, day, the last day you could file bills, uh, that there was a that we had not had a, a Senate version of school finance filed at that point in time. It was filed at I mean right at the deadline. One second to the end. Yeah, I think yeah, they right. may have rolled back the clock, but that's okay. Um, the, the, it was filed and it and had blanks in it. I had never seen a bill, particularly a bill of this import and something we had been talking about for so long that literally had blanks in it. We thought we were going to see it this past week. Uh, now we're told that we'll probably see it next Wednesday. Well, time's running out, and here's what worries me, well, a whole lot worries me, but one of the big things that worry me is that when time's running out like this and you haven't seen it, what will start happening is the push to just do what's ever in the bill. That is not the way Bills ought to be done, particularly bills of this level of importance. They ought to have a they ought to have a thousand mothers. They ought to have a lot of people getting to talk about it. They ought to have a lot of input. But you 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 know what we'll be told, and I've heard this, these words before, is we're running out of time, and so they're not going to listen. Yeah. And and I think that ends up being bad bad public. But policy. aren't you, Senator? Aren't you in a box politically? How could a Democratic member of the Texas Senate not support any legislation that puts nine billion dollars into public ed? I mean, what are you going to do, vote against it? It's sort of like the $5,000 across-the-board increase for teacher pay, which a lot of people have an argument against sure. in terms of the message that's sent. But in the end, you all voted for it because you can't be against a teacher pay increase. Well, Aren't you in the same position on this? It's not. Well, clearly, if we have a poor process that leads to a difficult vote because on the surface it looks like you're voting against something important, Right. Um, 
I'm sorry about that. I'm still going to vote what I think is right on this. And, and frankly, what you just described is the, is the way the pressure is put on to pass whatever needs to be passed, and I'm just not going to do that. So you're, that. Not, you're not committing 100% to vote for that bill? When I, oh, no. I think teacher pay is something that should have been done a long time ago. How are you going to get some of our very best people into education when you pay them one of the slowest salary scales in the state for a skilled workforce? And that's why I filed SB 995. In a way, it's too simplistic to be the entire mm -hmm. uh, school funding mechanism, but it took the same amount of money and it put it through the formulas to be spent at the discretion of local school boards to do what they wanted to do. Yep. All of it had to go to teacher pay to try and see if we could sort of duplicate the Dallas Independent School District model. It took another several billion dollars and just ran it once again through the formula so that every school district in the state of Texas benefited from it once again to be spent at the discretion of the school districts for the aides and the custodians and the counselors. Right. Uh, I, most superintendents that I spoke to, and I talk to them all the time, are very interested in, in if they have any money going to uh, as good a full day pre-K as they can as they can get. And let, let me say, because you, you ask the, the question you ask, sure, there there it's common, it happens all the time that a bill I, I may vote for a bill that I don't consider to be perfect. Um, frankly, there are very few that I've thought were perfect. But, but one of the things that worries me about where we are right now on this is it was only a couple of weeks ago. We act like it was a long time ago that the sales tax idea got thrown out. It was only a couple of weeks ago. The, the, the whole thing has been slow. Um, I will tell you that last session, I thought it was a very poor consolation prize that what we got was a school finance commission. Commission, right. Um, I thought it was a very, and I think I even said back when we were talking before yeah. that, that I'm, I'm rarely wrong, but sometimes I'm not as right as I'd like to be. And, and so what happened on this was it produced a very good product. Yeah. Now, I don't, you know, things like outcomes-based funding, I think we're still going to have a fight over, um, and, and we should. But there, there are parts of this that are very good. Right. But we, but we're way late in the session, and, and I'm worried that there are going to be parts of this that, that, the, that those in control of the Capitol are going to try to, to make the hammers that may end up creating problems for I mean, passengers. The, thi the thing at the beginning of the session was we can't do school finance reform without property tax reform. It looks like property tax reform is much farther along and has oh, a much yeah. higher chance of getting done. Could you imagine a scenario where you do property tax reform but no... School finance reform? Here's, here's, you all can't get out of here alive if you don't do school finance reform, we right? Have, not to say that we did a competent job, no. But here's the silver lining. Senator Nelson is going to name a work group. Given the, the, the apparent reluctance from people in both parties, reluctance or objection, uh, to sales tax, and we're going to look at all the options. What are our other options to reduce property taxes and things? And my understanding is at this stage... We're going to talk about everything. Everything. What would be an example of Gas everything? tax. Gas tax. Casino gambling. Marijuana. Uh, I, wh whatever sources, whatever other sources we can think of. And, so and there's I, still more conversation to be had on this. There is more be. conversation, right. and it's going, to be, um, it's going to be interesting in areas right. that we've not really touched on in depth before. I want to go to questions from the audience in a second, but i got two more for you here. Uh, I have two-sevenths of the nominations committee with me up on stage, which is not a violation of the Open Meetings Act or whatever, but um, is David Whitley going to be Secretary of State the day after the session, Senator Seliger, yes or no? I don't think so. Do you think his nomination is dead? you think it will not get to the floor? At this moment, and, and I voted for you it. You voted for him, that's I, right. I, don't, I, I see no signals that it's going to make it to the floor. Senator Watson? I agree with that. Yeah. Um, was there a way this could have gone differently other than going back and undoing all that stuff that happened on that Friday late in the day? Was there any way that this could have gone differently once that release went out and the die was cast? Um, I think it's, it's, boy, it's hard to say and with 2020 hindsight. I, I, I said at the time of the hearing um, on, on Secretary Whitley that 
he was given many opportunities to indicate that this was uh, flawed, that this was wrong, and he was also given opportunity to try to uh, do things to roll the clock back on it, and none of that occurred. It didn't take Right after the hearing, I think if he had simply said me a culpa and gone back to square one, take everything been done up to this point, wipe it out, and start again, the, the goal of this is, is correct, to ensure that everybody votes, is legally entitled to vote, and I think maybe we could have taken out uh, the, the things that people most objected to, but we should have gone back to square one on that very day. And he was given those opportunities. Right. Yes, he was uh, given those opportunities and suggestions. Has, has the lieutenant governor or anybody uh, t to either of you uh, talked about the conditions that would make a special session likely or necessary? I want to understand whether we're going into extra innings to pick the analogy back up that I started with. Senator Sullivan. Not, not specifically. I, I think you if, see any route there, I guess. If SB 2 had, had not passed, that would I think that would be his preference. I don't know about, I think... I don't know about SB3, but once again, we have to remind ourselves it's the governor that calls a special session. Not the lieutenant governor. You, you, what do you think? I've, I've been, there's nothing specific that makes me think that we're headed to a special session. In fact, everything I've been told has been the contrary. Okay. Let's go to questions from the audience. Got about 10 minutes, sir. I'm an engineer and computer scientist. I'm as an engineer and computer scientist, I'm used to looking at problems as they are, not as I wish they were. And I look at this tax business, all these hassles about property taxes and sales taxes. The problem with sales taxes, it hits the lowest income people the hardest. The problem with property taxes is if you get a big property tax bill, you can't just cut off a piece of your property and hand it in. The bill is uncorrelated with your ability to pay. So, what is the comparable problem with a, a progressive income tax? The biggest problem is it wouldn't pass. Yeah, and, and it's part in fact, of it. In fact, I feel I feel inclined to rebuke you for even bringing it up. <laughs> Just so that everybody leaves or am I on Twitter? He rebuked him immediately. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the, the, the problem is, and it really it's the only really progressive tax around, but people so mistrust the, the income tax mechanism and collection and everything else on the federal level, justifiably so, they, they don't trust us to do it any better or more reliably at the state level. I had a bill a couple of sessions ago that would have created a uh, relief valve for people whose income was... <laughs> The, the property values and taxes went up to a point that they, that, you know, because that doesn't keep up with your, your income doesn't necessarily keep up with that, and it would create a relief valve so that people would be, actually, my bill created a pilot program to create a <laughs> look at a relief valve. It got vetoed because it had the word income in the bill. Um, I filed it again this session and haven't gotten a hearing, so it just, it's just I think you may practice. want to call it something else next time. But, but take this into account. Yeah. Even without an income tax, we have a tax system, as, as, as lacking as it is, that produces a lot of income. I mean, after a fashion, it works $9 billion reserve in the last two years. And, and I, I don't see another source of income, uh, right. another source of taxation that's going to produce that kind of income. And politically, as you both know, it's yeah, yeah, that's, why, that's why I rebuked him. Hoping this isn't the other word that gets rebuked. Ha. Real look at casino gambling since we're fundamentally funding public education in Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, right. New Mexico. Is this Senator Nelson's task force going to give serious consideration to the economic development, jobs, well, and income that it would generate? I, I think we're going to have a discussion of, of all the options. The, if you recall, one of the objections to, to casino gambling were the pathologies that follow gambling and things like that. And, right. and that's altogether true. But with gambling in both Nevada and New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Louisiana... Um, We're a donor state at this point. All the, all the people who have gambling pathologies 
are using them just across the border. It's right. net effect here. Having gambling in the state and the situation exists now when it comes to pathologies, right. I don't see any difference S at S all. S Senator Watson, does the behavior of the Senate lead you to believe they'd be more open to casino gambling or marijuana? No. Uh, no. Uh, you know, I mean, we, they, everybody would have to be high to be going on with <laughs> casino gambling. Right. We'd have to pass the second one to pass the yeah, first yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, it, the, right. the, the, if there's a discussion of casino gambling, it will long, last long enough for them to say bust. Yeah. Can, uh, I, can I ask, <laughs> though, on, on casino gambling and marijuana, and while we're at it, let's put in Medicaid expansion. There are a number of very conservative... I'm so nervous. Where, where, where yeah. this is going? Yeah. Yeah. There, are a number of, there are a number of very conservative states around us with very conservative state leaders yeah. who said not just no, but hell no on marijuana, not just no, but hell no on Medicaid expansion. They took it to the voters, and the same voters who elected those conservative leaders yeah. said at the ballot, hell yes. Yeah. And so Medicaid gets expanded, and there's relaxation on the marijuana laws. Don't we trust the voters of Texas enough? If we trust them to vote on our property tax increases, don't we trust them enough to tell us whether up or down they want Medicaid expansion or marijuana reform? Here's the problem. People equate Medicaid expansion with Obamacare. And, and the truth is, when you talk about Medicaid expansion, um, we're going to have more people as our population grows. We're going to have more people on those rolls for Medicaid. We have to because if we don't, they're all going to go to emergency rooms where federal law says they must be treated in the most expensive way possible. And then you have a real property tax problem. You've got a lot more of a problem there because that falls right on the counties, as, as little concerned as we are. What do you think about your vote? Would your voters in your district, if they were given an up or down on Medicaid expansion or an up or down on some relaxation of marijuana, either medicinal or recreational, what would they say? Well, as, as Kirk said, depending on how much they had to smoke first. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Senator Watson, we know, know what your district I, yeah, would I, do. I, I feel pretty confident. Exactly. <laughs> You're like... <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't polled this. Right. But You're I, like <laughs> Senator Kirk Watson, Democrat of the Armadillo. I yeah, mean, yeah. the fact is, we know... I haven't we, polled we know it, but, what I, doing. but I, I yeah. think I know where the wind's blowing on that yeah. one. Okay. I, I saw Chairman Heflin's hand go up. I can't wait to see what this question is. So you go first. <laughs> Sir. I have to say, as I've said many times before, Senator Watson, as a person serving in the legislature when you were mayor, for the last three decades, you were the friendliest mayor to legislators in the last uh, three decades. Thank, thank you okay. again well, for that. Uh, my question, question is yes. this. As I listen to you all, it appears to me the signal I got was that the sales tax was dead on arrival. Did I interpret your comments correctly? If it ain't dead on arrival, it is, it's awful close. We need a young priest and an old priest, right? Come in. If, and if it's not dead on arrival, it, 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 it it's uh, an extremist at this point. If what we hear is true, yeah, that there are true, even right. Republicans who are not sold on the Well, concept. the math doesn't work, right? If you need two-thirds, yeah. there's the yeah. math doesn't work. You need Democrats, which you probably don't have, and you can't afford to lose any Republicans. Yeah, yeah. It's a con it's because it's, it's for those that don't know the, the, the intricacy of the rules, the, the, a constitutional amendment requires a two-thirds in order to get a vote in both chambers to get it on the ballot. And so I, I, right. I think it's it's awfully close to that. Uh, can I just jump in one thing? Because something occurred to me as we were talking about this, and I actually thought that uh, Chairman Heflin uh, and TPPF, I, I had was focused. What, what happened to paid? What's happening with paid sick leave? So the oh. the Creighton bills that are effectively the mechanism to undo paid sick leave they have passed. passed, and they include the language that Senator Watson and other Democrats are concerned uh, invalidates or has the potential to invalidate the non-discrimination ordinances. You voted for the Creighton stuff, did you not? Mm -hmm, I did. You, you, you voted against. My understanding on the House side is that there is zero stomach and zero interest for the legislation as it's coming over from the Senate with the... With well, it's the, because people know what, the, what really right. happened there. I mean, right. he, he filed a bill that had in the bill language that says this doesn't prevent a local government from having non-discrimination ordinances. Those are exempt from this otherwise bad bill. I didn't say it exactly that way. Um, <laughs> That was dead. Oh, no, then, then the next step was they went in and stripped that language. Now, why would you strip that language other than you want to do away with non-discrimination ordinances? 
That ended up being dead. So then he breaks it up into little parts and into four separate parts. And on the Senate floor, I ask him specifically, your bill deals with benefits at work. Right. And if and and and, and what you can do in, in with contracts with people. And one of the things is you can't say this guy only has to work 30 hours when this person has to work 40 hours. That would be part of it. Can we, and that's right. You can't discriminate, right? Can we add that language? No. Right, you said if you have no intent for this to go in that direction, why don't you just say so? He said no, bill passed. You, 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 yeah, you, vo you voted actually against the religious refusals bill in part because you said you were concerned about discrimination. Yes. So you've actually put yourself on record as opposed to, in that case at least, that, but you voted for the bill in this case. I'm opposed to discrimination and the opportunity or the inclination to discriminate. You don't believe that the Creighton bills create the opportunity to discriminate? I believe that Senator Creighton is very sincere about what is his, his intent and not intent. His basic purpose there, which is overreach, which is not a good thing at every level of government, I think are very important. Right. Um, so if the Senate bill goes over to the House and the House strips that language or does something to basically do, cre create the provision and it comes back over to the Senate, the Senate's going to have to choose at that point through the conference process. Right between whether we want to get rid of paid sick leave bad enough to strip this other thing or whether we're going to let the paid sick leave deal go down impaled on this other thing. So, I think we ought to do whatever we need to do to see to it that the basic tenets of, of the original Senate Bill 17 are passed into law. And, and Was I'll, it 15? Okay, sorry. And I'll start with the proposition that, once again, the pre I think the premise is wrong. This was clearly directed at Austin with the idea being that we don't want Austin telling folks what to do because somehow it would be bad for business. We're sitting in a city that is a focal point in a worldwide information and knowledge economy and part of the reason it is is because people are attracted and we can retain them to come and work in a place that cares enough about people that it allows for paid sick leave. That's just that okay. simple. Let me, do one, let me do one more before we end, right there. Uh, woman right there in the one, two, third, fourth row, please. Right here, yes ma'am, yes. Um, as Senator Seliger, oh, as Senator Seliger was just saying about if we don't expand Medicaid, people go into the hospitals because they're federally mandated that the hospitals have to do it. Well. Um, isn't it also true that the counties are federally mandated to make sure that all um, individuals who are, uh, that everyone gets an attorney if you uh, have a criminal case, that you have a right to, for an attorney? And the county, I've just gotten on a committee that's looking into this, and the county is going, where are we going to get the money? We are federally mandated that all these people need to be represented by um, also competent counsel, I believe, um, and where are we gonna get the money? It's a great and timely question because one of the things, the, one of the few areas mm -hmm. where people are saying when it comes to SB2, let's do a cutout is to uh, exempt from the cap indigent defense. That was Senator Flores' amendment, was That's, it not? Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that is one of, of uh, the, 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 the cornerstones, I think, of, of our constitutional rights that everybody has competent And counsel. there was bipartisan agreement on that, right? But there is. Yeah, uh, again, I'm absolutely in favor of it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there is bipartisan. I think we've, the, that has come up over and over and over again in Senate finance, session after session after session. Again, be careful, because if we do it this time to get it through, Will we do it next time? And then we've already put the caps into place. All right, we're going to let these guys go up and, s and solve the problems of the world. Give Senator Seliger and Watson the Thank big you hand. all. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.